All right, welcome back. This is going to be part four of the Unit 2 Notes, Living World Biodiversity, part four of part five. We're almost there. So in this video specifically, we're going to look at adaptations. Um, another word for adaptations you might think of is evolution. So we're going to talk specifically about adaptations and evolution. Um, so wildlife migrate. We know this. They move for a variety of reasons, but they also move for natural disruptions. Um, some species migrate for a short-term period, like migratory birds, ducks. They move to warmer clients, climates in the winter, and um, they're, they have specific reasons for when they're in certain areas. They, they mate in a certain area, um, but there are also species that migrate on a, lar on a longer term. So as we see more global climate change occurring, many species are going to new habitats. Some can actually survive in those new habitats, but a lot of them are also being forced to extinction. You're also getting species moving into new habitats where the native species is now being uh, forced out because of competition. So when we think of adaptations, we think of biological evolution. This is just how life has changed over time with genetic characteristics of populations, you can think of Darwin. This is Darwin's idea, right? The origin of species is the biological evolution is, has, you know, all life started in one form and has changed and moved um, through natural selection to create new species. So individuals with certain traits are more likely to survive. You know, natural selection is like survival of the fittest, uh, the fittest, survival of the fittest. And, um, natural selection kind of gives us an idea of how different species arrive. There is a lot of evidence for um, natural selection and biological evolution. So it's really important to understand that this is not the some topic that we're just pretending is real. There is a lot of evidence and a lot of continuing research going on to, that supports this. And when we find new species, that new species typically fits the idea of evolution and natural selection. So the idea of different populations when we start on a small scale, as populations have genetic variations, then you see evolution occurring. This is the first step in biological evolution. So mutations in reproductive cells occur, which changes the DNA, which causes new traits in, a, in that individual. And as the traits change more and more, causing that species to have maybe a better chance at certain um, you know, food or survival, then you're going to start seeing as the steps towards becoming a new species. So natural selection is specific to individuals, the second step, right? An adaptation may lead to a differential reproduction where they can no longer reproduce with the original species that they came from. Um, genetic resistance is a big part of this. So as you, it's the ability for one or more members of a population to resist a chemical designed to kill it. Um, so we'll look at an example of that. You can think of, say, we have some bacteria, okay? And we're looking at an antibiotic to remove the bacteria because the bacteria is harming you. But in this sample, there are a lot of normal bacteria and a few resistant bacteria that have some mutation that allows them to be resistant to the antibiotic being used. So as an antibiotic is introduced, many of the population has died. Some of the population dies out normally, but you notice that that resistant bacteria is still there. Now the resistant bacteria has started to reproduce and because the antibiotics are not effective, that population is increasing. So at the end, you will find that the now now the majority of our new population is the resistant bacteria and this doesn't have to be an anti uh, to an antibiotic it could be to any type of ecological tolerance um, and this could be any population the idea is the the resistant bacteria is able to survive in a different niche and so it is allowed to reproduce and eventually it will become the more prevalent uh, species now Obviously, that resistant bacterium may not be resistant to a different type of antibiotic, but there may be a different bacterium uh, mutation that occurs. And so this is why typically antibiotics continue to have to be um, improved upon and 
revised. So when we talk about natural selection, there are limits, okay? Um, they have to precede the change in the environmental condition. This isn't something that, you know, oh, climate change is occurring and it's getting warmer, so species are starting to adapt to that higher climate. That's not how it works. There has to have been a species that already has the mutation that allows it to have a higher tolerance, which allows it to now have a better chance of survival than, say, the other, part, uh, the other members of its species. Um, the reproductive capacity is also very important. A species that can reproduce very quickly and in large numbers is going to have a better chance of adapting. This is why when we do studies of natural selection, they typically use species that reproduce very quickly and in large numbers. Humans takes nine months to make one. We don't reproduce on a very quick scale. So if, for instance, a major change were to occur that affected humans, we, we would see a bottleneck effect, which is something that happened with the Black Plague. So species that are able to adapt quickly are species that are able to reproduce quickly. And this is why a lot of the large mammals and, you know, mega large animals like mammals like mammoths um, have died out because they reproduce so slowly that there is less chance for adaptation. Um, some of the myths about evolution through natural selection is that fitness is reproductive success and not strength, okay? Just because a species is stronger doesn't mean it has the ability to reproduce, and that is what's important. The success of being able to pass the genes on to the next, gen uh, the next generation. We also know that organisms don't just develop traits because they want to or need to. You can't just say, well, hey, now that I've start, you know, that I remember being told a myth that, hey, humans have less hair now because we have so much air conditioning and we don't need the hair to keep us warm. Or so much heating, so we don't need the air, the, the hair to keep us so warm. In reality, the fact that it has, we don't need to be so warm doesn't really have a huge effect. Many people still have a lot of hair. This is not something that is actually happening. We, it's not, we didn't get up one day and say, you know what, I don't need as much hair anymore, so I'm just going to evolve. That's not how it works. And there's no grand plan, right? And this is, this is a scary idea. There are many species today that might have, you know, many of the species that are exist, in, exist today exist today because they had the adaptations to make it through the last ice age. These species might not have the adaptation in place to allow it to survive a mass uh, increase in global temperature. And so this is where we kind of get worried about the, um, the idea of, of extinction because those species that did live thousands to millions of years ago when the temperatures were higher than they are today, those species don't exist anymore because they weren't able to survive through the ice age. Now, the hope is that there are species that survived the Ice Age that have now created genetic mutations that have allowed them to survive, and we will obviously see bottlenecking occur, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be this grand plan. It doesn't. There's no guarantee of any of this, and it could happen very quickly. It could happen very slowly, and most of the time, it's just general luck. So, how do new species evolve? The one way is speciation, which is where one species splits into two or more species, kind of like what we were talking about. Um, there's geographic isolation, which is usually the first step. So this is literally a physical isolation of populations. So one example is the brown bear that began to migrate north towards, um, towards you know, Alaska. The brown bear had a worse time than say the polar bear which it eventually uh you know had offspring that became the polar bear now this was a physical isolation polar bears cannot mate with brown bears even though they are descendants of those bears because they were physically isolated from the populations and that's where you get the reproductive isolation which is where mutations and natural selection in those geographically isolated populations occurs and now you have new species completely. Typically, you don't see speciation occur in one small area because they are not 
geographically isolated. So another example is the gray fox and the um, arctic fox. These are two different species. So the early fox population existed, some spread northward, northern, uh, northward and southward, and they separated. They had their own different adaptations in those different climates, which caused certain species to survive through those mutations. And now we are at a point where these two species cannot mate. They are no longer the same species, even though they came from the early fox population that was the same species. Now, another part of evolution and natural selection is obviously extinction. So if you recall in the sixth extinction, one of the one of the points that was made was that um, natural selection and extinction are two sides of the same coin. Extinction is where an entire species ceases to exist. It just does happen. It's very natural. Um, an endemic species is something that is close to being extinct because it's found in only one area, so it's more vulnerable. So the the um, one example of this is the kiwi, which ex is a type of uh, bottom feeding fish that lives in Pyramid Lake. It is the only place that you can find that species. If Pyramid Lake has a large enough ecological disturbance, that species will become extinct because there are no other species of that fish. Um, background extinction versus mass extinction. So there is a low rate of extinction that occurs naturally. It's natural, it's in the background. Mass extinction is when you have a significant rise above the background level. And we'll talk about the numbers behind those specifically because it is important to know what the numbers are. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'll talk about the numbers right now. The background extinction rate, what we consider to be the typical background extinction rate is one species one species per one million species that's spelled wrong per year so the idea here is that for every million species one species will go extinct every year this is the background extinction rate okay now we are currently seeing numbers in the tens to hundreds to thousands that is mass extinction so right now we are high above the background extinction rate. All right, so that does bring us to the end of part four. You got part five left. Um, when you're ready to watch part five, go ahead and do so and enjoy the last video for unit two.